I, I can't tell you how glad I am to be here. This has really been an enormous pleasure, and I know that uh, many other people share this pleasure with me. One participant remarked to me that this has been the best conference that he has attended. He didn't say this year, <laughs> period. Uh, Professor Baycote uh, remarked in his comments today that at this conference we have actually conferred. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that interesting? But now I want to talk about the evangelical engagement with natural law. I want to talk about its status. The title of my talk is More Than a Passing Fancy? Question mark. The problem is this, before I can address, and by the way, I will be speaking very rapidly because this talk is too long, because I want to try to say something about each of the papers. They, uh, they all add something to this engagement in a way that I think is very important. Uh, and I, if possible, I want to leave some time for Q&A at the end. So if I seem to be speaking at 130 miles an hour, or maybe 165 or something like that, that is the reason. I know that is contrary to all of the norms of good speakerly behavior, uh, especially while people are trying to enjoy their lunch. But I hope I don't give you indigestion, OK? So before I can address the state of the evangelical engagement with natural law, there's another question that seems to come first. When we say evangelical, whose engagement are we speaking of? What makes the engagement evangelical? And I don't think that we've agreed about that at this conference. You might, question, you might consider the question a little bit silly. What answer could there be but that the conversation is evangelical if the people having it are evangelicals. You, let me, you might call that the nominalist answer to the question. All of the speakers at this conference, except I think the two bookends, uh, me and Professor George, and also Professor Van Drunen call themselves evangelicals, and even me, George, and Van Drunen are evangelical friendly. Not so fast. What makes evangelicals themselves evangelical? Is evangelicalism just a name for the collection of individuals that we call evangelicals? Or do these evangelicals have something in common beyond the name, something to which the name refers? Professor Covington's paper suggests in passing that evangelicals are marked by certain theological distinctives, belief in the authority of scripture, in the profound effects of sin, in the centrality of right relationship with God. Professor McGraw's paper also supposes that there's something distinctive about evangelicals. In 1997, when I uh, I still identified myself as an evangelical. In those days, I, I, I said that I was in the Christian wing of the Episcopal Church. Uh, a Catholic friend asked me, what do you mean you're an evangelical? What is an evangelical? What makes you an evangelical? And I gave a similar answer. I said, uh, well, I, uh, I, 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 I call myself an evangelical because I believe that the Holy Scriptures are true and authoritative. Uh, that right relationship with God comes through faith in Christ as our sin bearer, and that consequently the individual must consciously choose his loyalty to the Son of God uh, and accept what he did for us. Well, he surprised me a little when he replied that in that case, just by being Catholic, he was an evangelical too. Uh, I think my friend was right. The distinctives of evangelicalism are not theological. Consider the evangelical participants in this conference hail from at least three different uh, theological traditions, Lutheran, Calvinist, and Anglican. In other places, I've met other kinds still who call themselves evangelicals. Uh, evangelical historian Mark Knoll suggests that the distinctives of evangelicalism are not theological but cultural. They are the marks, he says, of the Protestant subculture that emerged from the great American revival movements called the Great Awakenings. Uh, revivalistic religion seeks mass appeal. It tries to reach the greatest possible audience. It is direct, personal, populist, and intuitionist, suspicious of tradition and authority, interested in the greatest possible simplicity, focused on immediate results, reliant on intuition rather than systematic uh, theorizing, and inclined to place final authority in a common sense reading of the Bible even if a common sense reading of it may require one to pass over the hard parts or make them easier than they are. As Professor Drunen suggests, evangelicalism is non-confessional. To the present day, I would say these are the marks of the evangelical subculture. These are, these are the marks. Now, uh, because in this country, interestingly, and it's a fascinating story, evangelicalism has become the new Protestant mainstream. Uh, the, the most numerous group, the most rapidly growing group of Protestants, it is easy to forget that originally it was a break with the Protestant mainstream, just as Protestantism was a break with Catholicism. But having reached this point, we have another difficulty. 
Although the evangelicals who've spoken at this conference identify in some sense with the evangelical culture or subculture, they don't seem, these people here, to have the marks that I just mentioned, do they? They are interested in reaching out, but they aren't populist. They want to be understood, but they aren't intuitionist. They accept the authority of scripture, but they try to read it in continuity with the ancient Christian traditions. Although they reject obscurantism, good, here they are doing history, systematic theology, political philosophy, uh, all of these fields potentially obscure. Well, what is it then that most sharply places them in tension with the evangelical subculture? Is it that their interest, is it their interest in a theory and tradition, I mean natural law, that evangelicals have often viewed with suspicion? Is that what puts them in tension with their, with their, uh, with their culture? Partly yes, but I think it is also, and even more so, the sheer fact that they are interested at all in theory and tradition. Now, if I am right, then, to the degree that evangelicals are serious about engaging the natural law tradition, which is a theoretical tradition, it's an ongoing living tradition, to the degree that they are willing to search their memories of Christian culture and even pagan uh, culture, to the degree to which they are willing to dig into the clay of fallen man until they find the living bones of his nature, even as eaten into by the fall, they are not so much expressing their evangelical distinctives as they are challenging their evangelical distinctives. Complete success in their enterprise would mean abolishing all those things that Noel talks about, those characteristics, and reintegrating their communities with ancient Christian tradition. And yet it remains to be seen how evangelicals will view that ancient tradition, even if this, such a thing should come about, whether they would conceive the ancient Christian tradition in more traditionally Catholic or in more traditionally Protestant terms, one wonders. I agree with Noel that the distinctives of evangelicalism as such are cultural rather than theological. On the other hand, as we've also seen here at this conference, various confessional traditions do compete for evangelical loyalty. Lutheran, Calvinist, even one might argue Roman Catholic, for evangelicals have shown an increasing interest in investigating the resources of Catholic tradition, even if they are sometimes a little uneasy about this and sometimes prefer to use expressions like the consensus tradition. Uh, for example, in understanding just war. Needless to say, these traditions are marked by theological distinctives, a fact that the papers at this conference put prominently on display. In the meantime, how can one fail to be fascinated by such a constructively self-destructive enterprise <laughs> of abolishing one's subcultural distinctness? Especially because the most striking thing about it is that from one point of view, evangelicals who are interested in the natural law are mounting their challenge to the evangelical distinctives in the name of evangelicalism itself. As I'd suggested, the root from which the evangelical distinctives grew was the revivalistic desire, bless it, to reach the widest possible audience. Now that desire was the reason for all of those features of the evangelical cultural physiognomy. Uh, such as intuitionism, immediatism, and urgent desire to simplify. Now, have the evangelical thinkers at this conference lost the evangelical interest in reaching out? Obviously not. Not as I read them, not as I hear them, but what if the old revivalistic methods are no longer effective at reaching out? What if they don't work in that way anymore? To put a point on it, what if traits like immediatism have become not means of reaching the non-believing population, but obstacles? to reaching the non-believing population, or perhaps obstacles to reaching them in the right way. A population which is already, to give but one example, all too immediatist in American popular culture, albeit not in the same way. What if Americans have come to speak less and less like their religious great-great-grandparents than like the pagan skeptics of Mars Hill in the first century after Christ? What if the holy scriptures in our culture have long ago ceased to be a cultural lingua franca? What if all the districts have become what the revivalists of old called burned over districts? What if, as Professor Watson's paper suggests, henceforth the political and cultural outreach of evangelicals must make contact with traditions like natural law, which lack, may we say, the evangelical feel? 
Well, then perhaps to be true to the even evangelizing impulse that gave birth to the evangelical subculture, that subculture must change. Perhaps in a certain sense, it must gloriously abolish itself. Perhaps if it refuses to change in the requisite manner, then it will no longer be true to the evangelizing impulse and will abolish itself anyway, but in other less glorious ways. In a small way, I think that such change, such change uh, is underway. And I have no idea what is going to come of it. And I think it has been in a small way un underway at this conference. The engagement of evangelicals with ancient Christian traditions like natural law is also inevitably an engagement of evangelicals with evangelicalism as such, with what it means to be an evangelical, with all that has pre prevented a more serious engagement with the great tradition in years past. This engagement is still young. How far has it come? Well, let's consider the papers at the conference. I begin with Daryl Charles' paper, Bearing the Wrong Corpse, Protestants and the Natural Law. After a most careful and subtle historical summary, Professor Charles concludes that although the reformers broke from the Catholic Church over theology, they remained in continuity with the tradition over ethics, particularly in affirming the natural law. This statement seems to me to be uh, very largely true. But I wonder if it might be overstated. The reformers' innovations in theology in some ways made it difficult to maintain the continuity that they intended in ethics. I don't want you to take me the wrong way. I'm, I'm not at the moment saying, uh, oh, I think their innovations in theology were all wrong. I'm just, but I'm pointing, calling attention that there is a certain tension here. Uh, perhaps the earliest manifestation of this problem concerns sacramental theology. Sacramental marriage is absolutely indissoluble. Um, according to the tradition, but Luther denied that marriage is a sacrament, even if it is undertaken between two Christians. From this point of view, natural marriage is all there is. Uh, uh, a Christian marriage is just a natural marriage between Christians, and therefore divorce becomes thinkable. Now, once the firewall of indissolubility is breached, the conditions under which divorce is, may be granted tend to become more and more relaxed. To be sure, Luther affirmed the reality of the natural law, but was he in continuity with the teachings of the natural law tradition concerning natural marriage? Actually, he was not. Now, according to some Protestants, I, I suspect that this point would be, would be perhaps controversial at this conference, and I don't render a judgment about it. It is not for me to judge. But I say that this is out there. According to some Protestants, a more profound manifestation of the difficulty of innovating in theology while maintaining con continuity, continuity in ethics concerns soteriology. The Lutheran theologian, Helmut Thielicke, who has been mentioned here, did not deny that Luther had affirmed the natural law. What Thielicke held, rather, was that these were, quote, occasional, re occasional remarks, quote, relics of scholastic thinking, which cannot be reconciled with Luther's real theological intent concerning salvation. In a word, Thielicke believed that Luther had nodded, that had the great man fully thought through the implications of his doctrine of justification, then he would have realized that it precluded the possibility of the natural law. Many Latter-day Calvinists, uh, or some, I, maybe I shouldn't judge about the number, hold similar views about Calvin's support for natural law, that if he'd worked through some of the implications of his views, he wouldn't have been a supporter of natural law doctrine, even though recent scholarship has been demonstrating that he was a much more enthusiastic supporter of the natural law than, than, um, than uh, we had been thinking. Yes, they concede, these critics, perhaps Calvin did believe in the natural law, but considering what he believed about sin, he shouldn't have. What these Lutherans and Calvinists are saying is that one cannot remain in continuity with both Reformation theology and pre-Reformation ethics, at least not logically, they claim. Now, I think then that for the completion of, of Dr. Charles' uh, project, it would be necessary for him to, to go a little further and to present an explanation of why those Lutheran and Calvinist critics are wrong, and that this, uh, this combination of the innovations over here but the continuity over here is logically possible after all. Uh, Dr. McGraw, the doctrine of creation and the possibilities of evangelical natural law. Professor McGraw thinks that the doctrine of creation uh, provides evangelicals an entry into the theory of natural law. I think that's right. Uh, he also finds a problem. As he explains, 
quote, reaffirming as we ought to the centrality of Christ to creation perhaps means that we must also recognize that understanding that creation and the normative ethos that emerges from it properly requires in some sense an embrace of Christ and his authority and example. This does not mean, I think, I'm still quoting him, that those outside the church are unaware of the natural law or don't feel its authority. The witness of scripture and common observation are too compelling on that issue. But it does suggest that efforts to construct simply rational arguments for the natural law will likely fail to persuade, and that evangelical employment of natural law arguments, while necessary and even fruitful, must always be cast with an eye toward this kind of conceptual and rhetorical gap. I think that's a very interesting suggestion. Um, as I'll discuss at greater length when I come to Professor Kuenhoven's paper, I think not only that this is true, but also that this problem has been, surprise, surprise, the central focus of Roman Catholic theological anthropology since the Second Vatican Council. Precisely the central focus, which they claim is in continuity with concerns that go all the way back through the Middle Ages, all the way back to the fathers of the church. Here, though, I'm not going to talk about that. I will in a minute. Uh, let me put it into a longer context. The natural law tradition has passed through three historical phases and is now entering the fourth. Phase one belonged, we might say, to the philosophers. Ancient thinkers like Aristotle had discovered that things have natures. And they tried to develop intellectual tools for thinking about them. Phase two belonged to the theologians. Christian thinkers explicitly appropriated I don't mean without correction, the whole philosophical tradition, but they identified the divine logos of the philosophers with Christ. Phase three was dominated by the Enlightenment thinkers who tried to sever the connections between faith and reason, and consequently their natural law theories were stripped down, flattened, diminished natural law theories, uh, where, and it was not only the resources of faith that they threw out, it was even a lot of the resources of the classical doctrine of nature of a natural teleology, for instance. Their aim was to turn natural law theory into a body of axioms and theorems that any intelligent, uh, informed mind would consider obvious, no matter what religion or wisdom tradition it followed. Now, the reason that we're entering a fourth phase of the natural law tradition right now is that the Enlightenment project collapsed. Natural law thinkers are beginning to follow a different path while retaining the idea of a universal ethics valid for everyone. They have abandoned the Enlightenment fallacy of neutrality. Is there a common ground? Yes, but it's not a neutral ground. Not all views of God, not all views of the structure of reality, not all views of human nature itself are equally adequate and some make it much, much harder for a thinker to stand on that common ground. It, is a, it becomes a slippery common ground. We scarcely know how to deal with this problem, but we will have to learn. Jesse Kuenhoven's paper, Kara Barth's Eschatological Rejection of Natural Law. Professor Kuenhoven's argument that the Lutheran theologian, Karl Barth, rejected not so much the idea of natural law as a particular conception of natural law is absorbing and surprising. I had not considered these arguments. I can't help but add, however, that even so, I think, not Professor Kuenhoven, but Barth is confused. Uh, according to Kuenhoven, Barth associated the idea of natural law with the idea, in the first place, of mechanism. This offended him because our relationship with God is, in fact, personal. It is a threefold relation with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Moreover, Bart associated the idea of natural law with a, quote, static conception of human nature, which offended him because it does not account for the historical dynamism of our relationship with God. As Kuenhoven explains, the ions of salvation history, along with their associated divine covenants, quote, build on one another in ways that cannot simply be predicted or inferred from the logic of the previous ion. Kuenhoven concludes that Barth's, quote, fundamental dissatisfaction with natural law theory, as it is traditionally conceived, is not that it connects ethics with the order of creation, but that it is not thought that connection, that relation through. The traditional thinker's reason, according to Barth, quote, as if natural law were always a matter of being rightly related to the past, to Adam, and not to the future, that is, to Christ. By contrast, Barth says, Jesus Christ, is the secret truth about the essential nature of man. There's only one problem. Barth's characterization of natural law, of the tradition, bears no resemblance to the doctrine as 
traditionally conceived. What Barth is really attacking is the Enlightenment conception, the modern rationalist conception of natural law. Unfortunately, he has so little respect Barth does, for the classical doctrine that he does not really bother to find out what it is. Consequently, he confuses the friend, what ought to be a friend, with the enemy and assaults them both. As to this business of mechanism, for instance, although the classical natural law thinkers didn't deny the reality of efficient causes, even in, our, even in some aspects of our nature, especially our physical nature, some things make other things happen. Of course, the heart pumps blood, the, you know, the blood moves along. They insisted that nature is also a realm of purposes. And the deeper consideration on natural purposes also leads you to the purposer, the designer, to God. It was the rationalists, not them, who later denied that natural purposes can be known and still later denied that they even exist. For them, nature was a realm of blind, efficient causes, of things being pulled around by strings. To that way of thinking, mechanism is all that is left. Their critique is correct. The target's been misidentified. As to the historical dynamism of our relationship with God, now I have so much to say about this, and I expect it to be met with such, such skepticism. Sir, what, could I prevail upon you to pass these, these, uh, these around? That I have prepared a, a Appendix 1, a little handout. <laughs> uh, Appendix A, suffice it to say the thinkers in continuity with the classical natural law tradition insist on the relevance of salvation history to an understanding of natural law. They do not neglect it. According to an, this has been anciently recognized, but also recently recognized. According to an important recent document of the International Theological Commission, for example, which is a body of the Catholic Church which advises the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, that was the body that uh, that uh, Cardinal Ratzinger, when he was still Cardinal Ratzinger, used to head up. The patristic writers apprehend natural law, quote, in the environment of a history of salvation that leads one to distinguish different states of nature, original nature, fallen nature, restored nature, in which natural law is realized in different manners. Mind you, these, uh, these uh, writers are not saying that these are different natural laws, but they are saying that these are different manners of realizing natural law. Or one might read Thomas Aquinas' commentary on the Pauline passage on the law of Moses as a custodian, leading us not to Adam but to Christ or many other things. I dare say that if you like Barth's remark, I do, that Jesus Christ is the secret truth about the essential nature of man, then you may be startled by the, by the Second Vatican Council's teaching that, quote, it is only in the mystery of the word made flesh that the mystery of man truly becomes clear. And you may be exhilarated by John Paul II's explanation of that remark that, quote, Christ alone, through his humanity, reveals the totality of the mystery of man. The key to man's self-understanding, says JP2, lies in contemplating the divine prototype, the word made flesh, the eternal son, of the Father. The primary and definitive source for studying the intimate nature of the human being is therefore the Most Holy Trinity. Kuhnhoven comments sadly that to his knowledge, and yeah, it makes me sad too, only one philosopher or theologian has developed these Barthian ideas, and that thinker wasn't interested in natural law. Now that may be true in Protestant circles. You Protestants would like to correct that. Great, I, I, I would too. In Catholic circles though, as I said, Although there are some mysteries here and puzzles as to how to make it work, these ideas have been the central focus of theological anthropology of that, which means of the theology of human nature ever since the Second Vatican Council. Paul DeHart, Reason and Will in Natural Law, some reflections on moral obligation. Well, as to Professor DeHart's deep and challenging paper about reason and will in natural law, I wonder whether he thinks that anything essential is missing from this, this following statement of the matter. Uh, it's such a complex argument, it's such a, a multifaceted argument that I, I'm, I tried to work out my own summary and I always wonder in a case like that whether I may have put more, into, more of myself into the summary than, than, than actually accurately exegeting DeHart himself. Um, I, it looks to me, after reading his paper like this, the rational necessity of doing what is good may seem to make God's will irrelevant and his command superfluous as intellectualists, quote unquote, hold. However, one need not be a voluntarist to recognize at least four ways in which moral obligation is connected with God's freedom. I will brutally condense. I've got a longer version of these comments, believe it or not. How could it be longer than this? Uh, you know, what, what, imagine the speed at which I may have been talking. 
And these, these brief comments are about four times longer. First, obligation depends on what God freely chose to do in the same way that there being a universe at all depends on what he freely chose to do. Um, because of the, 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 uh, the opportunities for good uh, action that are in that universe. Second, obligation depends on what God freely chose to do in the same way that the properties of this universe he might have created a different one, even if he'd created, depend on what he freely chose to do. Third, obligation depends on what God freely chose to do in the same way that all grace depends on what he freely chose to do. For he has, and he may not have done this, he might, for all we know, he might have, he might have arranged the, the universe differently. He has ordained us to a supernatural end that surpasses our natural powers. Fourth, calling vocation depends on what God has freely chosen to do for he could have called each of us into different vocations than he did now I'm not sure whether a calling is always a command these others are more clearly connected with commands um, although it's still obviously connected with God's uh, with God's will um, the reason I'm not sure whether it's always connected with a command is that failure to respond generously to a calling on the one hand it seems sometimes to be an invitation rather than precisely a command, but on the other hand, we're exhorted uh, um, uh, if the Lord should speak today, uh, 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 harden not your heart. And failure to respond generously to that gracious invitation always does involve, even if it is not sin, privation of the grace that is associated with the calling itself. Well, anyway, continuing an attempt at summary here of, uh, of his argument, insofar as command is implicit both in creation, is both implicit in creation and clear to our intellects, the natural law suffices. Insofar as it is implicit in creation but not clear to our intellects, the divine law of scripture is a supplement. Insofar as we are ordained to a, to, we are ordained to a supernatural end that exceeds what we could have known or attained by our natural powers, then the divine law is not merely a supplement, it is our sole instruction. And yet even here, the dock is made so as to receive the ship which the dock cannot provide for itself. Our nature is made, is so made as to be the dock of grace. David Van Drunen's very interesting paper, Natural Law and Mosaic Law in the Theology of Paul, Their Relationship and Its Sociopolitical Implications. This is an outstanding paper. Allow me to quibble about something. I suggested earlier that because some Protestants deny that one can hold on to both natural law and Reformation soteriology, Professor Charles, I think, needs to extend his argument in order to address uh, why that is wrong. With Professor Van Drunen, in a certain sense, the difficulty is reversed. I think he needs to say more about one aspect of his argument too, but what he needs to say more about is why one cannot hold on to the right view of natural law unless one does accept uh, Reformation soteriology. He doesn't say that you can't hold on to natural law, but that in order to, hold, to get it right, you've got to hold Reformation soteriology. Well, now let's think about this. The most distinctive element of Reformation soteriology is the view that justification is purely forensic uh, or imputational. Now, I don't hold that theory. Uh, I don't believe in works righteousness. I don't think we earn brownie points by being good, and then God says, okay, you're good enough, you get in. Everything depends on grace. Um, but I can't see how God's declaration that we are righteous can be separated from his grace in actually making us righteous, unless God is a liar, and I don't believe that he is. Now, uh, there's plenty for us to discuss there. Perhaps I've mischaracterized the doctrine, you know, who knows. But I do want to ask how much in what Van Drunen says about the real but limited role of natural law really does depend on this, on this uh, theory of how justification works. Doesn't most of uh, what Van Drunen says about the real but limited role of natural law in the world depend on other things that are not in dispute between us? Take, for example, Van Drunen's very interesting discussion of the Pauline passage about the law being Israel's pedagogos, guardian, custodian, until the coming of Christ. Catholic natural law thinkers love this passage too, despite the difference in their soteriology. And they are fond of quoting the patristic writers who comment on it. Augustine says, the unrighteous man must be led, quote, as by the schoolmaster's hand, to that grace by which alone he can fulfill what the law commands. Gregory of Nazianzus, after remarking that, quote, the scope of our art, he's speaking of spiritual direction and preaching and so forth is to provide the soul with wings to rescue it from the world and give it to God and he adds this is the wish of our schoolmaster the law of the prophets who intervened between Christ and the law of Christ who is the fulfiller and end of the spiritual law 
in the same context, Clement of Alexandria compares the law of Moses with, interestingly, with sound philosophy. Insofar as sound, not the empty, vain philosophy that St. Paul criticized, insofar as sound philosophy testifies to God's reality and moral requirements. Perchance, too, he says, it's just a speculation. Perchance, too, philosophy was given to the Greeks, primarily and directly, until the Lord should call the Greeks. For this was a schoolmaster to bring the Hellenic mind to Christ, as the law of the Hebrews to Christ. It seems that we are not necessarily in disagreement about this and substantially in agreement about this. Must we, we, must we revoke that disagreement, which may not be what you intend, and I, and I hope that I will be corrected if I've got you wrong, because we disagree about uh, forensic justification, or am I missing something? Now, I do see one significant disagreement in our views of natural law. I don't think the disagreement results from our soteriological disagreements either, though. Um, Professor Van Drunen emphasizes that although the law of the gospel prevails in the community of faith, the standard for the civil magistrate must still be the, the natural law. Well, by and large, I agree. By and large, I think that's true. But I do think that there are two important exceptions. And perhaps uh, uh, Professor Van, Van Drunen would agree with me about this. One exception is that when people are very corrupt, the civil law may have to fall temporarily below the level of the natural law because people must be raised gradually rather than all at once. The other exception, as, as, in, is, as in one famous passage of, uh, of uh, Thomas Aquinas where he quotes the, the book of Proverbs, uh, if you blow your nose too violently, it brings forth blood. Uh, that can be a problem for civil law. The other exception is that when the community of faith is a faithful witness, it may sometimes be possible for the civil law to encourage higher things than it actually commands. Consider the fact that when grace entered the world, the dignity of marriage, even among non-believers, in those countries where the community of faith was flourishing, became immeasurably greater than it had ever been. Nature was made for grace, even after the fall so powerfully does it point beyond itself that the strings of the lute preserve a faint memory of that lost music. When the heavenly city faithfully bears witness to the earthly, it prolongs and amplifies that reverberation, not so much by the punishment of wrong as by the praise of good. Law may actually have some role in that witness. Matthew Wright, Civic Friendship and the Christian Political Engagement. What I find most interesting and valuable, I'm going to leave out one of the things that I actually find the most interesting and innovative about his paper, having to do with a certain revision of Aristotle, because that's of less concern to us, perhaps, as Christians um, uh, than it might be to technical political theorists. But, but for present purposes, what I find most interesting and valuable about, about uh, Mr. Wright's paper is the way that he seeks to balance several different insights about Christians in political community without allowing any of them to overwhelm the others, as so often happens. Now, I wonder if he would be satisfied by the following way of putting them. It isn't his way of, of putting them. It's my way of putting them, and I'm drawing language from the doctrine of subsidiarity. Uh, some of the, you at this conference, I know, would use a third language. You would prefer to express it in terms of the doctrine of sphere sovereignty, and, that, and, and so the relationship among these three languages is, is really should, ought to be very important to us. Number one. I, I, I think you're saying Christians should not be indifferent to the political community. It's not enough to say that the civil law serves the narrow purpose of restraining evil. We must add that human beings are better off, their lives richer and fuller, because of the intrinsically rewarding opportunity to practice civic friendship, to cooperate for a genuinely common good. Number two, nevertheless, the political good is not a comprehensive good to which all other goods are just an instrument as Aristotle seemed to think. Although the political community should be organized in, in such a way that it respects the complete good for man, it is not itself the complete good for man. Number three, the political community is not a primary community like a family or the church, but a secondary community in which primary communities cooperate. They exist prior to the political community. They are not defined in terms of the political community, and each of them is ordained to some work, to the achievement of some good, whether natural, as in the case of the family, or supernatural, as in the case of the church. A good, which the, and a good and a work which the political community must seek neither to take over nor to absorb. Number four, it seems to follow that the most important work of the political community is to try to protect the background conditions that allow these non-political communities to thrive and yet, as I said earlier, number five, an intrinsic good of civic friendship supervenes on this instrumental activity. 
It would be most helpful to know more about the relationship between Wright's way of balancing such considerations and the subsidiarist and the sphere sovereigntist way of balancing these considerations and to what degree they, might, they are or are not harmonious. Jesse Covington, The Grammar of Virtue, St. Augustine and the Natural Law. I love Augustine too, and it's, it's wonderful that, he, that, that there, is, there, is, there is, even if there were no other father that Protestants and Catholics both love, that every, everybody loves this guy. He's like, like if, among the patristics, there's the C.S. Lewis for us, okay? <laughs> it's funny, my students, my students uh, can't take Augustine in, in big doses. I, I assigned them with a, with a co-teacher uh, the whole confessions once and they hated it. On the other hand, a year later, for the same class, we assigned them little sections, little sections from, uh, from uh, book two and I think book four of the uh, confessions. They loved it. So, okay, a little bit, <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Covington points out that evangelicals emphasize both the gulf between regenerate and unregenerate humanity and their common ground. For if the city of God and the city of man had no prior commonality in nature, it would be impossible for the gospel of grace to gain a hearing, impossible to evangelize, and therefore impossible to be an evangelical at all. Now that fact gives evangelicals good reason to engage the natural law tradition, doesn't it? But what is the most congenial point of entry? For evangelicals, what is the most congenial point of entry? The answer, thinks Covington, is Augustine, that is quite plausible, whose work displays the same two themes in tension that evangelicalism does. Uh, as a subculture, both the gulf and the common ground. I admire Professor Covington's brilliant, I think, elucidation of just what Augustine does think about the natural law. Um, this, 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 re this took an awful lot of reading to pick out and put together these things. He is a bit less successful, I think, in drawing out the practical implications. Appendix B. <laughs> Covington's basic conclusion is that the natural law is a necessary tool for achieving a political consensus uh, that is genuine but also limited. So far, so good. But for reasons diagrammed here, <laughs> sir, would you please? Thank you. <laughs> I hope you like Venn diagrams. <laughs> for reasons diagrammed in, in, in this uh, handout, the attempt to compare this insight, I think, with the Rawlsian notion of overlapping consensus is much less convincing. Um, you know, I, I better have one of them. <laughs> he, needs, he needs one. <laughs> is much less convincing. Um, I don't think Covington is wrong to compare his, what he's talking about with a kind of overlapping consensus. Uh, in fact, I think he's right. But the theorist of overlapping consensus I, whom I th with whom I think he ought to compare his views are not the views of overlapping consensus of the virulently uh, anti-Christian and anti-natural law thinker John Rawls, but the deeply pro-natural law Catholic thinker uh, in the post-World War II period, Jacques Maritain. Uh, Maitan's thinking about natural law was the engine, by the way, driving the movement that led to the UN Declaration of, Inter of, of uh, Universal Human Rights, which, is, which has been, to this day, the most celebrated success of the overlapping consensus approach to the realization of natural law insights in the culture and in political engagement. It's also, by the way, the most conspicuous example of the limits of that approach, because as we've seen then, it's one thing to adopt a least common denominator overlapping consensus approach uh, and as a statement of basic principles, and quite another thing then to keep uh, it, it from being blurred and even hijacked from other forces who oppose the natural law. What Maritain had in mind, anyway, was that the moral common ground among the various worldviews that we contend with might provide a pretty good first approximation of what natural law doctrine holds to be actually true. He also thought that over time, prudent statesmen and scholars could improve the quality of this approximation because the natural law tradition provides resources that can be turned to good effect in dialogue. Rawls, unfortunately, has something quite different in mind. The key term in his theory is public reason. Now you would think public reason would mean reasoning in public, right? For Rawls, no, it means limitations on the kind of reasoning that, are to be, that is to be allowed in public. He calls his approach to public discourse political, not metaphysical, and he forbids political appeals to what he calls comprehensive doctrines, which are views of reality as a whole, about which reasonable disagreement is possible. 
natural law theory turns out to be one of the doctrines that we're forbidden to refer to. It's a comprehensive doctrine, just as our faith is. The whole thing, of course, is a scam. Uh, I mean Rawls, not Covington. <laughs> there is no such thing as an argument that is neutral among views of reality, which is what he's trying to pretend. Therefore, the practical effect of the impossible demand for neutrality is to selectively forbid, rather than universally forbid, uh, reliance on contestable worldviews. The Rawlsian says, my worldview is not a worldview, but yours is. Vincent Bacot, natural law, friend of common grace. Now, at this point, my remarks might seem extremely quirky, uh, be if they haven't already, <laughs> because I want to expand on something which, in the context of Professor Bacot's paper, is really a side issue. But I think it's an important side issue. Um, I've seen it come up in other contexts, and, and so I want to draw out why I think that's important. Professor Bacot uh, discusses, at one point, a dispute between the by now infamous uh, Nelson Klosterman and, uh, <laughs> and David Van Drunen about the correct interpretation of a remark by Abraham Kuyper. Uh, and this discussion brings to the surface a much older dispute concerning St. Paul's famous remark, when Gentiles who have not the law do by nature what the law requires, they show that what the law requires is written on their hearts. Okay, I'm abbreviating the quotation, but this is of course Romans 14 through 16. According to many Reformed exegetes, not all, certainly not all, uh, uh, maybe not most these days, I'm not sure, the statement applies not to all Gentiles, but only to regenerate Gentiles. I've often met this interpretation. The idea is that although God wrote the law on the tab tablets of the heart at creation, fallen man is so thoroughly suppresses his uh, knowledge of the law that the law must be rewritten. Uh, uh, you know, it's just not there anymore. It must be rewritten on the tablets of every heart at its conversion. Now, it seems to me that there are several points to be made about this controversy. The view that Paul is speaking only of regenerate Gentiles would, it's, it's not totally implausible. It would be more plausible, I think, if Scripture used the analogy of writing on the heart in only one sense. But in fact, Scripture employs the analogy of writing on the heart in a number of different senses. In one sense, uh, in the Old Testament, the sin of the people is said to be written on the people's hearts. In another place, also in the Old Testament, God exhorts the people to write, they're doing it themselves now, to write his law on their hearts. In the Messianic age, says one of the prophets, God will write his, heart on, his law on the hearts of his people, but do so more perfectly, so that they not only know it, but can obey it. And in yet, in still another sense, his law, as we see in Paul, is already written, even on the hearts of those who do not have the law of Moses. These seem to be different kinds of things, different people doing the writing, different kinds of writing, more effective writing, less effective writing, writing that gives you knowledge, writing that gives you ability to follow. These are not the same thing. Even if St. Paul were speaking in this passage, that's still an open question of regenerate Gentiles in this here. I don't think so, but even if he were, the Bible is overflowing with other testimony to general moral revelation. To give but a single instance, the same apostle reproaches the Corinthians for tolerating in their midst a man who is living with his father's wife. Immorality, says Paul, that is not found even among the pagans. Well, that raises an interesting question. How do the pagans know that it is so shameful? Even if the other passage about the law written on the heart is not a testimony to the law written on the heart in that sense, it sure looks like this one is. Number three, uh, a lot of critics of natural law tend to overlook many other scriptural confirmations of the reality of natural law because they take too general excuse me, too narrow a view of what general moral revel revelation is. The passage on the writing on the heart concerns only one form of natural testimony to God's law, the witness of deep conscience. But as you know from hearing me in another context, there are at least three others. In the view of Scripture, we spontaneously recognize, even if we suppress this recognition, the designedness of things. Hence, hence, we recognize our dependence on the designer. And this is not just an ontological witness, there is a designer. It is a moral witness because we also spontaneously recognize the principle of gratitude for benefits received. He designed us. He made us. We owe our very being to him. Scripture also holds us accountable for recognizing the details of the line of the design, for example, Paul's example, sexual complementarity. Finally, Scripture emphasizes the natural consequences of our actions, which are readily observable. Um, I don't think Professor uh, Bacot necessarily agrees with any of that, but I just wanted to bring it out. And, and I think that his paper, for, you know, by, bringing, by discussing so many of these 
uh, these matters um, um, provides a, an, 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 a very interesting occasion for that. Uh, Michael Watson, C.S. Lewis's natural law evangelist, evangelical political thought of the people in the, in the pew. I am enormously impressed with this paper, and it's partly because I love the paper, and it's partly just because I love Lewis, and it's partly because it's such a good ex exegesis of, of Lewis, whom I love. Uh, this is lucid, it's well-reasoned, it's keenly interesting. Now, I do want to quibble with one of his conclusions, and some of this has already uh, come out in our discussions. Uh, um, Dr. Professor Watson rightly emphasizes the fact is prior to theory. Yes, man, I, I, I can't tell you how strongly I agree. I just wrote a book, and that was part of, part of one of my themes. The subtitle was Natural Law as Fact, Theory, and Sign of Contradiction. <laughs> I was saying you've got to separate those three things. He rightly points out that Lewis is more interested in proving the fact than in convincing us of a particular theory. I think he's right there, too. Lewis is making the case that natural law is real rather than making the case that some theory of natural law is true. So far, I agree. But now comes what I think is a non sequitur. Um, Watson seems to say, and I hope I've not misunderstood here, that Lewis, well, at first I thought that he was saying that Lewis had no view as to which theory of natural law is correct, was not very interested in which, natural law, which theory of natural law is correct, and did not need such a theory in order to make the case that it was real. Um, I'm not so sure that that is his view now, but maybe, uh, but I'm, I'm on the basis of hearing him in conversation and in, and in, and in our, our uh, conference, maybe it is that Lewis did think those things, but didn't think we needed to dig into them. Okay, he writes, it is altogether too easy for those of us who are evangelicals and academics to wistfully gaze over at our Catholic colleagues and their nearly 800 years, of course they would say, you know, uh, more than 800, <laughs> of working on and from a Thomistic understanding of natural law, evangelicals must come around to the notion of natural law consistent with evangelical convictions first and then work out the application details. Now, I think that none of this follows, and I think it's mistaken. Uh, Professor DeHart has anticipated part of what I want to say. In the first place, even though fact is prior to theory, and even though theory must humble itself before the fact, there is simply no way to defend the reality of the fact without theorizing about it. Simply calling attention to a fact is already an act of theory, because, because among other things, people will inevitably step in and deny the fact. We must then re reply to their objections, and the more persuasive our defense of the reality of the fact, the more pervasive our dependence on some view of how the fact actually works so that we can make the defense, not to mention some view of why people don't simply agree about it, and that's theory. We may not drop the, the theory on their heads and say, you know, it's in the backs of our minds. It's not necessarily in our words to them. We don't say, will you turn to me, please, to the Summa Theologica, first part of the second part, Question 67, Article 2, uh, reply to Objection 3. No, we don't do that. Um, but we are, in fact, relying on, on, on theory. All that is theory. Lewis's defense of the reality of natural law is not without theoretical commitments. It may seem to be because he wears the theory so lightly. Um, he doesn't wave it around like that. And yet, fathom upon fathom of theory lies beneath everything that he says about the fact. What theory of natural law does Lewis actually hold then? It looks like it's a kind of an eclectic theory. He draws heavily on Plato, on Augustine, on Cicero, and at least by way of Richard Hooker on Thomas Aquinas. Page after page, paragraph after paragraph, he shows himself their disciple. And I would say that this is true not only in his prose, but I think it is true, equally true in his speculative fiction. Now, in the second place, I want to ask, do we have a false dilemma here? Uh, option one, wistfully gazing at the resources built up during hundreds of years of Catholic reflection on the natural law, evangelicals scramble to build up treasures of their own. Option two, reminding themselves that the important thing is not to understand the natural law, but to defend its reality, evangelicals relax. Yes, it'll be good to have treasures, uh, theoretical treasures of their own, but these will come around in their own good time, uh, and it'll take plenty of time, and in the meantime, there's no need to rush. Now, it seems to me that both horns of this dilemma rely on the same assumption, that if evangelicals can't develop their own resources, they have to do without. Why should this be true? Why do they have to develop their own resources? Why can't we share resources? Um, the earliest Christians were willing to glean what they could, even from pagan philosophy, taking, taking what was useful, rejecting what was not. This was called plundering the Egyptians or sharpening one's knives in the tents of the Philistines. <laughs> 
Now, unless one can show that Catholics are even more dangerous than Egyptians or Philistines. <laughs> The, the view that one may look at the Summa but not touch seems less a way of engaging natural law theory than of not engaging it. Now I know, I know from conversation, this isn't what Watson believes, that you must look but not touch at Thomas Aquinas, obviously not. As he remarked this morning, we borrow, we have to borrow, we will go on borrowing. But what I hope he means when he says that evangelicals need an evangelical natural law theory, eventually, isn't that they need an evangelical theory, as though one has to be reinvented from scratch, but rather that they need an evangelical explanation of the theory, a, a way of explaining the theory without relying necessarily in every other sentence on the technical apparatus of the theory and mystifying them with distinctions, you know, and which makes sense to them. Well, a, a, a distinctively evangelical way of explaining the theory is not the same thing as a distinctive evangelical theory. And maybe that's what he means, and I hope it is, and if so, that we're exactly on the same page. Now, my conclusion. The evangelical engagement with natural law is, among other things, an engagement with the community beyond evangelicalism. One thing is needed for this engagement to reach maturity. Evangelicals, am I enough of a friend to be allowed to put it this way? I hope, I think so. I think of myself as a friend. Evangelicals need to get out of the house more. I take the liberty of putting the point this strongly because I am a friend. If evangelical thinkers are serious about engaging natural law, they have to pay more attention to what non-Protestant thinkers have said about natural law over the centuries, especially Catholics, and they must learn what Catholics say from Catholics, not from other evangelicals. At several points, I've called attention to a certain reluctance to do so and to misunderstandings that persist because of this reluctance, to reticences about natural law that persist from... Uh, from misunderstandings that have arisen because of this reluctance, even here at this wonderful conference devoted to breaking down barriers to engagement. If we're going to be friends, then we're going to have to become better and closer friends. Where we disagree, we must work through our disagreements as friends do, uh, rather than ignoring them, minimizing them, or misconceiving them in the face of the disorders and confusions of the unregenerate world. We cannot afford to be indifferent. Now let me reassure you in case you think, man, that guy, I, 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 that's the most patronizing I've ever heard anybody, anybody would be at a conference like this. Let me assure you that I say much the same thing to Catholics, and maybe I'm just being patronizing to both sides. It's even worse than you thought. Um, I don't think so. Catholics are deeply serious about the natural law, sure. Uh, it was said by Richard no John Newhouse that the Catholic Church practically is the, ec the ecumenical project. Uh, that may be an overstatement, but they're certainly committed to even ecumenical dialogue and, uh, and deeply concerned about the prospects for common ground, both with the non-believing world and especially with Protestants whom they regard as brothers. Even so, they miss opportunities. And it's very frustrating. Earlier I mentioned the, uh, the search for universal ethics, this statement by the International Theological uh, Commission. At a certain point in the report, the authors undertake a review of ethical, uh, of ethical views of other traditions. Surprisingly, in this review, well, you know, here are the Hindus and here are the, the, uh, the Muslims and so forth, Protestants aren't included. No, it's not what you think. They aren't, Protestants aren't omitted from the report, just from this part of the report. But why should they be omitted even from this part? Surely this requires discussion. Well, the problem, it turns out, arises not from viewing Protestants as so far away that you don't need to talk about them, but, as, but, as, but in, a, in an odd sort of way, the problem arises from viewing them as too close. In the eyes of the church, often it looks like Protestants are not exactly an independent tradition or even a disputatious family of traditions, um, but a group of separated brothers. Now, yes, they, they have certain difficulties with natural law, but the ITC's the International Theological Commission's diplomatic strategy, if I may so call it, seems to be to sort of minimize those differences um, as though, and I think this is what they believe, they were all a basis of a misunderstanding which is clearing itself up. As uh, uh, they remark at one point, for instance, that the Protestant antipathy to natural law, it looks like to them, arose principally in the 19th century and wasn't there among the reformers, so, and that this is clearing up. Well, as all of us at this conference know, Protestant objections to natural law are a good deal more vexing than that. And so there needs to be more, more, more discussion.
So I think a great opportunity was mixed there, and they need to sort of get out of the yard too, right? Uh, and you know, read more about what these what these uh, Protestants are saying. Um, and I need to read more about both of them because I'm swimming in a sea that is too big for me, and I am ignorant about so many things. Uh, we must ask Muslims why the Muslim engagement with natural law, uh, at least for most Muslims, ended in the Middle Ages with what Sunnis call the closing of the gates of of interpretation, and why that project can't be resumed. We must ask the heirs of the Enlightenment who threw out so much of the treasure of the classical natural law tradition that at last natural law stopped being plausible to them at all, why it is better then to descend into hopelessness than to go back and look for those lost treasures that they had thrown into the yard. These will be difficult conversations. I think we'd better start having them. And I think that we'd better begin with each other. This conference has been a superb and enjoyable step. I thank you all for the opportunity of taking it with you and these precious conversations to friendship in the natural law and to friendship in Christ.